When the question is asked, what do you want? Which is the first and the last and the foundational question of the soul. What do you want? One of the soul's uh, most important and uh, unavoidable answers is the answer to belong. I want to belong. I want to fit somewhere. I want to feel like I have a sense of context and history and future. I want to feel like I'm being served and I want to have an opportunity to serve, to love and be loved, know, to be known. I want to belong. I want to fit. What do you want? I want uh, to belong. The Bible uh, contains that theme of belonging at its core and at its central message throughout all of the scriptures. And when the Bible addresses that idea and that desire to belong, its primary metaphor that it uses to address that is the metaphor of the family. We find that on the Bible's very first page, where God speaks his creation into existence through Adam and Eve, the husband and wife, who are commanded to populate the world that God's created and put into order. We find it on the Bible's very last page as Jesus Christ returns as the groom to retrieve and to tend to his bride, that is the church, and to assemble all of the nations together, not so much in terms of their ethnicity, though it's clear in the scriptures that their ethnicity is not lost. But when we assemble in that place, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, where Jesus, the groom, is united with his bridegroom, the church, and they come together, that we are across nations, across tongues, across cultures, assembled as his children in order to live with him throughout all of eternity, a new heaven and a new earth where God comes down to that earth and makes God's dwelling with his family and with his people, and we will reign and rule with him throughout all of the ages, forever and evermore, and amen. On the Bible's first page, on the Bible's last page, and on every page in between, on the backdrop, is the answer to the question, what do you want? Of belonging. And the metaphor that the Bible uses over and over again is the metaphor of family. Family is where you go in order to belong, in order to be known, in order to be cared for, in order to be loved, in order to be seen. Family is where you go. And your families almost bear that out. Almost. I was uh, in my mind this week as I was thinking about some of the images and uh, stories of how family is portrayed and understood. So I flipped into TV land because uh, I'm a, 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 a professional couch potato at, at watching. I'm very good at, at watching. And so I just I was thinking through, you know, some of the TV families that have been influential to me in my life and thought of Ozzy and Harriet. And you people over here don't even know what an Ozzy or an Harriet it is, but they're... Uh, uh, them and the and the uh, Cleaver family, Leave It to Beavers. They've, uh, there was uh, there was a husband and there was a wife and there was, you know, two point three children and there was a, a picket fence and there was a dog and there was an annoying neighbor that didn't live at their house and their kids were great and obedient and thoughtful and um, it was it was it was great and and then somewhere along the way TV started to think to themselves we should venture out a little bit. I, I remember when I was a kid I used to watch a show when I'd come home from. From school, I used to watch My Three Sons, and uh, Fred McMurray was the actor. He he played this father of these of these three boys, and the mom was gone and uh, passed away. If my memory's right, she in the storyline passed away. She actually passed away in the show. She just wasn't in the show. And they had like a butler that lived at the house who did all the all the cleaning and all the changing. And it was a man butler. Do you remember the man butler on My Three Sons? Man, unthinkable thought that a man would be caring 
for other men like that. All the dishwashing. And my, my favorite show of all time was uh, The Brady Bunch. I own all 117 episodes, not just on Netflix. Like, I own them in DVD. I own them all. 117 episodes of The Brady Bunch, Mike and Carol, and they get married, and he's got his three boys, and she's got three girls. And, and uh, you know, in the, in the story, uh, I don't know if you know this from the pilot or not, if you've ever watched The Brady Bunch, but, but Mike's wife passed away. That's why he was single and could marry Carol. But Carol's first husband, we're not sure what happened to him. He, he may have passed away, but he may not have. She may have been divorced. Of course, by the time Mike and Carol got married and their children formed a whole new understanding of television family, they were able, Mike and Carol, to, to sleep in the same bed together, thank God, because Lucy and Ricky had worked that out for them. Lucy and Ricky used to sleep in separate beds, but then by the end, Lucy and Ricky were able to be in the same bed, which wasn't scandalous because they were, you know, husband and wife, but a little bit scandalous because, um, like, Lucy looked like me and talked like me and sound like me, and Ricky didn't sound like me and didn't talk like me and didn't look like me and didn't look like and sound like look Lucy either, but Lucy and Ricky were together, but they could pull that off because they were in real life like that, and so on TV, y'all didn't mind it as much. So they stuck them in the same bed eventually, and then Mike and Carol could go in the same, same bed as, as well. They could sleep in TV on this, on this, like you guys, you wouldn't even know what I'm talking about because y'all just, yeah, you know, people just sleeping everywhere now. <laughs> like it got so messed up in terms of what the presentation of the family was that eventually we needed Cosby to fix it. And so in the early 80s, Cosby came along and fixed it. And, and they were wealthy and educated, and they brought their families together. And then Roseanne said, that doesn't seem great. Like, let's have the husband and wife, and they're all the same kids, same family, but that's not how real people leave and live. And so, so Roseanne came along, and they put themselves, you know, still same nuclear family, husband, wife, same kids, just like Cliff and Claire were same husband, wife, same kids, but... Uh, and so they, those two held forward a picture of the family. And thank God that Bill Cosby and Roseanne are the images of what holding the family is going to look together <laughs> like. And then Murphy Brown gets all single and pregnant. And then modern family comes along. This fall, coming on ABC, Single Parents. It's coming. This, this fall. Here, here it comes. What's interesting, and maybe more than interesting, important to note, about how television has tried to tell the story of how our culture has moved back and forth and figured out how to grow or shrink or judge or be done with judgment on what a family is and what a family looks like. Like the enemy that, the, that Hollywood sort of uses to say those people over there have this very narrow understanding of what family is and what family means and what family includes and what family has to be is, is the evangelical Christian folks because we're the people who say that what a family really is, is a virgin boy and a virgin girl get married. Eventually, they unvirgin after they're married. Then they have children together. Those children stick together. They're married until death they do part. And that's what a family is. And anything other than that is not a family. That stands opposed as to the image when the... When Hollywood's looking to say, who's our enemy for saying what a family is? Like that part is, is what's held forward, which is a good thing that they use us in that regard because when you read the Bible, the Bible offers on every page throughout the story of the people of God this pristine, perfect, extraordinary picture 
over and over again of what family should be. If you want to know what family should be, you think ABC, NBC, NBC, and all the rest of it, man, you should read the Bible because the Bible's picture of family is great. We don't have a murder in the same family in the Bible all the way until page three. What does the soul want? The soul wants to belong. It wants to fit. It wants to be known. It wants to know where it's come from. The soul wants to know where it's going. The soul wants to know that it can rest and be safe and steadfast and secure. So when the Bible comes to talk about that, the Bible talks about that through the metaphor of the family, from the first page to the last page and every page in between. But when you read the story, along the way, you're begging for Mercy Br Murphy Brown. You're longing for the Brady Bunch. You, and right there in the center of the story, there is this critical tale of this 15-year-old girl who an angel comes to and speaks to and says to her, God is about to do something impossibly possible through you. Through you, Mary. He is going to send his only begotten son. Those are Jesus' own words of himself, found in the most famous verse in all of the Bible, John 3.16, in one of the more important conversations in all of the New Testament as he's interacting with, with Nicodemus. Jesus describes himself as God's one and only son, for God, who is the Father, so loved the world that he created that he gave his only begotten son. It's an unusual word. If I were speaking to you about Alexis, Isaiah, or Jonathan, my three kids, I wouldn't speak to you of them and say, I'd like to, to meet my begotten daughter, Alexis, and our begotten boys, Isaiah and Jonathan. It's not a word that is often used like that. But when you quote the Bible, those of you who have that one memorized, if you don't, that's okay, but if you do, probably use that word a lot. What do you even mean by that? You say it, have said it, hanging on your walls. You say it. It's an unusual word. It's an unheard of word. It's, it's the word that Jesus uses to describe himself. That Jesus understood his own place and his own posture his own sense of belonging, if I can stay with that language, that he had a relationship with God the Father that is distinct and set apart from anybody, uh, anybody else's relationship. For Jesus was begotten by God. Jesus always has existed. He does exist. He always will exist. There's no point of creation for or with Jesus. This is the biblical doctrine. I would understand why you would have questions or concerns or want to have conversations about how unthinkable that thought would be, which is not the point of my talk today. It's simply to say to you that as Jesus understands himself, he understands himself and his own sense of belonging as, his son, as God's son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever would place their faith and their confidence in him will never die, but will share in and participate in the undying life of God himself that is available to any and all 
who place their faith and confidence in him today, that you would start your life with him. And that life, which begins today, will never end. He offers the same life that God has, the same life that God knows, the same life that God enjoys. He offers it to every one of us. For we are not God's only begotten Son. We are, in the context of our sin, and our rebellion, and our disobedience, and our disbelief. We are orphans. Orphans. And what every orphan longs for is to be adopted. This morning, I, um, I want to offer three points to you out of the story of the most famous adopted person in the Bible. It might be uh, valuable for you to know that uh, in the Old Testament, the word, the Hebrew word adopt or adopted or adoption never actually shows up. The word is not even in the original, in the original language. In the Hebrew. In fact, in the New Testament, the word only shows up as Paul uses the word through a theological lens. The word is only used five times in the New Testament. So if you went home today and you pulled up Bible Gateway and you said, hey, Lumley's going to take the next six weeks of our life and he's going to rally around this idea of adopted and being adopt, uh, adoption and how that plays out. I wonder just how many times that shows up in the scripture. What you, you may find depending on what translations and the rest you look at, you may find the word adoption showing up in that English list more than five times. But the word adoption or adopted does not show up in the Hebrew in the Old Testament at all. And in the New Testament, the word only shows up five times at all. All five times, Paul uses it, Jesus never says the word. And yet, it's such a strong theological theme throughout all of the scriptures that I'm not convinced that the word actually is needed in order for you to see how this important family and theological theme shows up throughout all of the scriptures. And I want to lay a little bit of the groundwork there by um, just walking you through some of the early parts of Moses' story who is the most famous adopted person in all of the Bible. If you turn to Exodus uh, chapter 1, we will um, start here just as way of background, and I don't want to take too long to do this. The end of the book of Genesis, we're in Exodus 1. At the end of the book of Genesis, there's a fellow in the story by the name of Joseph, who uh, is a leader that God um, exalted in order to care for the Egyptians to take them through a period of plenty or excess to prepare them for a time of famine. He set aside in his best Dave Ramsey fashion items that were needed in a time of plenty that could then get them through a season of, of famine. And it was so influential and so important in the history of the Egyptians that he was exalted and his legend and his mythology lived on throughout the Egyptians for centuries and centuries until you come to the first chapter of Exodus that roughly, give or take, 400 years later, the king and the leader of the Egyptians, the Pharaoh, had no memory of Joseph or any of the things that Joseph had done. The Hebrews are now hanging around. Joseph was granted by Pharaoh, uh, a geographical location on the outside of Egypt called Goshen, where the tribes of Israel were allowed to go and live 
and replenish. And replenish, they did. God blessed them while they were there. And they had kids and children upon kids and children. Kids everywhere. And finally, by the time you get to the first chapter of Exodus chapter 1, the king of Egypt is looking around and the Pharaoh is saying, if those ants figure out, the Hebrews, if they figure out that there's more of them than there are of us Egyptian grasshoppers, this whole thing is going to go sideways. And they're going to run us out of town and they're going to take over. And so the Pharaoh decided that he would put a judgment on the Hebrews and he would put on the Hebrews the judgment that any male babies born were to be murdered at their birth. So he called in a group of midwives and he said to the midwives who helped with birthing the Hebrew babies that any male baby that was born to the Hebrews, those male babies were to be killed. I am in Exodus chapter 1, reading from verse 15, where the Bible says this. And the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and one of whom was named Pua. When you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women, and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, the baby shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded him. But they let the male children live. Point number one that I would say is a part of every orphan's story. Is that every orphan has a shifra and a pua in the story of their life? You know, when you think about the kind of circumstance and the kind of setting and the kind of situation that these Hebrew boys were about to be birthed into, they couldn't have had a lot of hope. Pharaoh has set himself politically, geographically, and nationalistically against the Hebrews. He, he said any, any boy needs to be taken care of so they can stop birthing the babies. So because of that, you would assume that any kids, any boys born in this era are not going to have a particularly easy life. They're going to have challenges, dynamics in their situation in their setting, in their circumstances. It would be a very logical thought for two midwives to say to themselves, the most merciful thing we can do, the most thoughtful thing that we could do, the best decision that we could make as we look forward at what these kids undoubtedly have to face It's to obey what the Pharaoh is saying. We should sh kill them. They should die. Over the last uh, several weeks, um, several of you have sent me stories of your interaction with adoption in your family or the family of some folks that you know or love. I, I've had a few that have been very short stories, very few that have been short. The short ones have kind of have, have sounded like this, and, and I don't mean to out them, but I don't think they're going to mind me uh, saying this. Short ones have sounded like this. Uh, Dear Ken, uh, thanks for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, my daughter just adopted with her husband a baby and we are so thrilled that baby is a part of our family just wanted to let you know great emails love them 
very short. But other than those handful of emails, the emails that I have received from you have been like this. And at every turn, in every story I have read, I hear within the story midwives who showed up in your tales of adoption and saved the lives of orphans who should have died. You show me an orphan and I will tell you the tale of an orphan that has contained within it a midwife who looked at challenging circumstances, settings, and situations and said, more than I am going to fear the hardships that could come to this child, I am going to fear the Lord and I am going to say what is going to prevail is the theme of life. What God can and will do in the child of this coming orphan. Things that we do not know. And over and over again, over the last three weeks, I have read your stories that have contained within them, in their own ways, people who have persevered for the orphans in your life when if they hadn't, those orphans would not have pulled through. Number one thing I want to say to you about orphans is that everyone needs a shifra and a pua in their lives. Number two, every orphan is carried at some point in an ark. Now, the most famous ark in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 7 as we read this story of Noah. As God commands Noah and his family to bring together the animals two by two. The Lord floods the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And Noah and his family are saved. They persevere. The animals are saved, persevere. The waters dwindle down. And when and as the waters dwindle down, um, creation is saved and humanity is saved and the animal kingdom is saved and uh, the Lord moves forward. That's the most famous ark in all of the Bible. Um, but there is a second ark, not ark of the covenant ark, but ark like this kind of ark that we see in Genesis chapter 6. There is one other ark, uses the same Hebrew word as the ark in Genesis chapter 6 that Noah had. And that ark is found in Exodus chapter 2. You have your Bibles and can turn to Exodus 2, we now move into the bread and butter of Moses' story and his earliest days. Now a man from the house of Levi, Exodus 2, 1, went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived, bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. She was able to hide him for three months because the midwives did not kill him. So for three months, she hides the child. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him an ark. Same word. Same word that you find in Genesis chapter 6 with Noah. We find here with Moses and his mother. She takes for him an ark. How did Noah put his ark together? With pitch and tar. How does Moses' mother put this ark together? This basket, this ark, she puts it together with pitch and tar. She made him a basket. And she put the child in it. And she placed it among the reeds by the river bank. Um, 
As the story unfolds, Moses' sister watches him there in the bank. Pharaoh's daughter sees the ark floating in the water. She goes to rescue it, pulls the ark out of the water, reaches down, pulls up the baby, and Moses' sister rushes over to Pharaoh's daughter and says, hey, you found this baby. I'm paraphrasing. And Pharaoh's daughter says, yeah, this is exciting. And Moses' sister says, what's she going to do with the baby? And Pharaoh's daughter says, I don't know. I can't feed the baby. And Moses' sister says, I know a lady who could feed your baby. And Pharaoh's daughter says, if she's willing, I'll pay her. And so Moses' sister takes her brother back to their mother, who breastfeeds and cares for Moses until Moses reaches a certain age where Moses is sent back to Pharaoh's daughter. And if you read Exodus chapter 2, verse 10, what the Bible says is that Pharaoh's daughter took Moses and raised him as her own. It does not use the word adopted. But that is clearly how the Bible understands it. And I know that because if you want to read over, turn over to Acts chapter 7. It's a different word than Paul uses for his theologically themed use of the word adopted. But in Acts chapter 7, the way the New Testament describes it is the New Testament says that Pharaoh's daughter adopted Moses as her own. And she raised Moses there in her house. Wouldn't it be great if every story of adoption was a wonderful story? Wouldn't it be great? So there's an orphan, and the orphan needs a home. And you come to church one day, and some guy like me stands up and says, adoption's really the best way to go. You all should try adoption. It's a spiritual reality in our lives. We all should head out adopting babies. And just in case you're nervous that that's where this series is going to culminate, me looking at you and saying, everybody ought to go out of here and adopt a baby. Worry not. <laughs> Maybe some of you should. But I am not going to lay that on you and say that everybody should. Okay? Y'all try to get me to adopt a baby right now? I'm going to need to take our Mexican fiesta tonight for the ladies' conference thing. And we have to turn that into a Mexican siesta. Because I'm going to have to move from a party to a nap faster than you could say, Bob, your uncle. Okay, uh, just in case you're worried. Um, not every story of adoption goes like Moses' story went. I mean, Moses is the one story that we've got recorded in the Bible, but he's not the only kid who gets saved during this time in the Bible. What happens to all the other kids? To all those other kids who get to live? but they don't get to live in the palace with Pharaoh and all the money. What happens to those kids? Where do they end up going? How do they live? How awesome is their parenting and community that they live in? Well, it should go great because every adoption story is awesome, right? Y'all ever listen to yourselves how you talk about adoption? That might be open to adoption. Let me ask you this. Where's that baby coming from? The mom, the dad. They do drugs. They come from poverty. They got some sort of illness in their family. That's you know, The babies never get to ask that about you. You just get to ask that about them. I don't know that I really ought to bring this kiddo into my house. But then you decide to do it. And wouldn't it be great when they wanted into your house if they just turned polite 
thoughtful and all those pains and patterns and things that they'd gone through, some of which they remember, a lot of which they don't. Wouldn't it be great if those all just magically disappeared because of how much you wanted to adopt that orphan and give them a place to belong? But that's not how every adoption story goes. I just offer this to you at the beginning of our series on adoption. Every orphan, however their story unfolds, every one of them, has a midwife who saves their life. And every orphan However, the story unfolds with a big red bow and a happy ending on it. Or whether it is one trip after one clumsy, after one painful, after another. Every single orphan finds themselves in a spot where they need someone to put them in an ark so that they can get from where they are to where they need to go. You show me an orphan. I'll show you a story with a midwife. You show me an orphan, and I will tell you the story that contains within it an ark that saved their life. Letter three and point three and number last. Every orphan, every one of them has to figure out and find out where they belong. Every orphan wants to know where they belong. This is true in our day. It was true for Moses. Moses, he is now a Hebrew being raised in the Egyptian palace. You read through chapter 2 and you see that Moses interacts with a troubling situation where some fighting that's going on and he steps in and he decides that he's going to contend for the Hebrews. It's part of it. He, he looks like them. He, he's able to be set apart for you. See, he's not Egyptian. You can tell. But, uh, so he chimes in the middle there and kills somebody. So he decides he's going to head out and he's going to go into hiding. And when he goes out into hiding, he stumbles on these Hebrews. And he, the Hebrews are like, what, you're going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? Egyptians are like, we don't want nothing to do with him. Come back here, we're going to kill you. So here he is, a Hebrew raised in Egyptian, but he doesn't fit in the Egyptian world. And now he's, he's in the Egyptian world. They know he's a Hebrew, so he, now he belongs there. So he ends up wandering out of this spot and he finds this pretty girl. Her family agrees to take him in. They get married. His father-in-law is a, uh, a priest. He, he's, a, he's a rabbi. He's a person of respect there in the community. And so you would think after decades of living in that area, you'd, you'd think he'd feel like he belonged. But as you read the story, it's clear that he's found a place to live. He's found a family that's taken him in. But his question of what he wants has not been answered to the satisfaction of his own heart. That answer comes in Exodus chapter 3. And so, one day, that was just like every other day, he woke up 40 years after leaving. He, he wakes up, and he takes the flocks with him, and he heads out with them just like he had done for 40 years. Running around, feeding the flocks, letting them get a little water, keeping them alive. And if you say, here we are, Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And now Moses, he was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness. And he came to the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Moses looked, and behold, 
bush was not burning, yet it was not consumed. And so Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. And then the Lord said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then the Lord said to Moses, I am your God. I am your father. I was Abraham's father. I was Isaac's father. I was Jacob's father. And today, I'm adopting you. And Moses hid his face. And he couldn't look at God. Probably not only because God was too holy to look at. I'm sure that was in there. But sometimes when you get news that is too good to be true, that you have wandered in a desert for 40 years, wondering if anybody anywhere wants you. When God sneaks up into your life, on an unexpected day in an unexpected town in an unexpected setting in a dark room in an uncomfortable chair sitting closer to your neighbors than you might like and he speaks to the orphan within you and says I was your midwife who kept you alive. I was the ark that brought you to the day. And I know you're just going to church to sing your three and a half songs and make your way to lunch. But there's a burning bush that you take note of he says to you, I chose you. I'm going to free you. You are a child of God. We assemble in this room together over the course of the next six weeks. And we share this in common, ladies and gentlemen. We are all of us orphans. And what we need is a father. And so from his begotten son, I bring you good news of great joy that is to all orphans. That unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. His name is Christ the Lord. And as the heir of his father, He knows that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And he says to his father, let's adopt them all. Let's let all of them be heirs. So in these days, may we not only find unity as a church, that we are orphans, may we also find unity as a church that by grace, through faith, we are all adopted.